Okay, I guess we can get started. Um, this is volcanic geology. Um, Dr. Anderson, you can call me Dr. Anderson. I'd prefer you call me Steve. We're all adults here, so we can probably act like it. I'm not gonna hand out a syllabus. Uh, there'll be a syllabus on the um, Canvas site. If there isn't already, I'll put it up tomorrow. But I will go through the major parts of the syllabus here at the beginning of class. So this is an advanced geology class on volcanoes. Volcanoes are my specialty. I've been studying them a long time. I'll try to pass some of the things that I've learned through the years on to you in this class. And you can kind of take a look at the major course goals here. Um, I think one thing that I probably do a little different than most other folks that teach this course is I tend to look at volcanoes from a really big picture, kind of a planetary picture. We're not just gonna look at volcanoes on Earth, we're gonna look at volcanoes on Earth and some of the other planets as well to get kind of a full range and understanding of how volcanism works everywhere. And I think that helps us actually understand what's going on here on Earth. Uh, might as well get the COVID thing out of the way right away. Obviously it's gonna be interesting maybe weird odd semester we're starting off that way i don't know how long this is going to last it might last the whole semester we might all be home in two weeks um i'll do my best to give a good face-to-face -face learning experience for you but if at any time i don't think it's safe to be here we're not going to be here if at any time you guys don't think it's safe to be here please tell me and then go ahead and do the online thing. We have, I think, 15 people in this class, and you can see half of them elected to do the course online. So I'm recording uh, the a video of the PowerPoint as well as the audio. I'm gonna mesh them together. It takes me a few hours, and then I'll put them up on the website tomorrow. So even if you wanna do face-to-face, -face, but you end up missing class, the information will be on the Canvas site. The Canvas site is limited in size. It usually only lets me keep about four or five lectures before it runs out of room. So I'll probably upload them to my own personal webpage or to YouTube, and I'll give you the link to that as we need to so that you have the whole semester's worth of stuff there. If the weather cooperates, and if we keep meeting face-to-face, -face, there's a little area by Bishop Lair that I've staked out where we could hold class outside. I don't want to do it when it's 90 degrees and the wind's blowing, but you know, if we have nice 60, 70 degree nights, maybe we can meet out there. You can bring a cooler, you can bring food, we can have some beverages and have a nice class, but we'll see how this all progresses. It's an option. I want to have a little tent for you guys to sit under and that hasn't arrived yet. So until the weather gets better or until I get my tent, we'll meet in here, okay? I want this to be an interactive class. So speak up, talk, chat, argue, do the things that you like to do in class here. I just don't want it to be an hour and a half of me blabbing on every every single week. So um, speak up when you have something to say, please. Okay, we're gonna have some lectures. Um, like I said, I'll record the lectures, put them up on Canvas or some other website where you can access them easily. It's a real bummer we didn't get to do our field trip. I'm really bummed about it. I was just up there a few weeks ago and uh, the last time I took a trip up there with the class, it was just, we had the best time. And I'm really, uh, they made it so difficult. I tried every avenue possible to pull off this I, and I do it safely. I think talking about my minivan. Yeah, there's, I looked at, I looked at us driving individually. I looked into all of it and they just, there was really no safe way to do it. So, um, but since we don't have a field trip, what I'll try to do, not this week, but starting next week, is the first 15 minutes, maybe half hour, however long I feel like talking about it, I'm just gonna take you to a volcano virtually. You guys don't have to take notes, you can just sit there and watch and talk and learn, and I want that to be a big part of the course. Um, you can learn a lot from field work, you can learn a lot from virtual field work, you can learn a lot from somebody telling stories. So I'm gonna try to make that a big part of the course since we were robbed of that um, experience. One of the biggest parts of this class is you're gonna do an individual project. It's going to take on one of maybe four forms. You can decide what you wanna do. Most of you will probably end up doing a hazard assessment of a particular volcano that you choose. And it can be anywhere in the world. When I took my volcanic geology class way back when, I chose a volcano in Guatemala, Santiaguito. 
And I ended up working there when I became a professor and wrote some papers on it. And I learned a lot just from doing the work that I did in class. So what you'll do for that is you'll read all the background papers that have been published on it. You'll find a topographic map of the area because most of the things that come out of volcanoes move, they flow. And things flow downhill and they tend to be channeled by topography. So just looking at a topographic map, you can start to get a good idea of what areas are gonna be impacted by certain types of volcanic activity. And then you'll consider what that area looks like in terms of the human population and come up with a hazard assessment based on the history of the volcano, how often does it erupt, what types of products does it erupt, um, where do these products go. You should be able to figure out on your topographic map the areas that will most likely be impacted by lava flows, pyroclastic flows, mud flows, whatever the hazard may be at your particular volcano. So it's a really good way to learn about a particular volcano itself. Um, and then at the end I'll have you do sort of an online presentation. All four of your options involve presenting. It's a big part of what we do in science. Um, now with this weird COVID thing, you're just going to have to learn to do it online. So you'll do an online presentation if you do a hazard assessment. You also have the option of doing a podcast. If you can find a volcano expert and come up with some good questions, it should be at least 30 minutes. You could do that. You could teach a class. This is volcanic geology. We're going to meet for a semester. I could probably fill up four semesters just with different topics that we could cover in this class. So I can't do it all. But if you want some teaching experience, what I'd like you to do is an online 30 minute class on something that I'm not gonna cover. And we can talk about what those areas might be if you choose to go that way. And your fourth option will be a research project, okay? So if you're engaged in some sort of research project that has a volcanic slant to it, David's working on one right now, you can use that in this class as long as you're not getting credit for it anywhere else. So you can pick a hazard assessment, a podcast, an online class, or a research project. And I'll give you a couple weeks to figure that out. I'll, let's see what we have here. Um, I'll get to it in a minute, but basically by September 8th, two weeks from now, I'd like to know what you're going to do, okay? And then you'll have the semester to actually do it. Okay, the course requirements, pretty simple. We're gonna have two exams, one midterm, one final during finals week, each worth 30% of the final grade, and then your course project's gonna be worth 40%. So your course project is going to be a big deal. If you do the hazard assessment, I want you to choose your volcano by September 8th. And when I mean choose, you have to make sure that there's been something written about your volcano, okay? Um, if there's been nothing written about your volcano, then it's going to be really hard to do a hazard assessment because you have no information on what comes out of it, how often it erupts, and all that. Um, most of the volcanoes in the United States already have hazard assessments completed. So you're not going to be able to choose anything in the U.S. and do it. It's no fun to do a hazard assessment after guys who have been studying the volcano for 20 years put one out and publish it. So you'll try to find a volcano somewhere else in the world that doesn't have a hazard assessment done, or at least not a hazard assessment in English that you can read. Um, there's quite a few hazard assessments for South American volcanoes, but most of them are written in Spanish. And if you don't read Spanish, then you might as well do your own because you can't really get much information from something you can't read. Um, and then the podcast and online lesson, those you have the whole semester to work on and I just need you to publish it online by November 24th. So the hazard assessment, this is all from the syllabus. You can look at the details of what you have to do for it. There's several parts to it. Choose your volcano by September 8th. Write up the volcanic history. That's going to be the main part of your hazard assessment is what has the volcano done in the past. And you figure that out by reading papers that have been published about your volcano. And then the actual hazard assessment is due on November 17th. And a lot of times the actual hazard assessment isn't super long, it's just a few pages. The most extensive part will be the volcanic history and I'll have that due in mid-October for you. That's the basics. We'll talk more about the details of each of these things as the semester goes on. Do you guys have any questions about 
what we're trying to do in here, how the grading is going to be, about the project, anything you want to know at this point. Yeah, um, I'll put everything online, so if you need to watch the first five minutes, it should be up tomorrow, but you didn't miss much. Okay, here's some of the topics that we may or may not cover. I don't know, it depends how fast we get through them. I have no timetable. I'm just gonna start in on one of the topics and we're just gonna go from there. See how far we get this semester, okay? Um, we're gonna start today with the real basics. Like, what is a volcano? Might not be as simple a definition as you think. Um, how magmas form, um, the properties of magma, the flu fluid properties, that's called rheology, study of fluid properties chemistry, volcanic products, what comes out of volcanoes, um, some of the physics and chemistry involved in magma moving from its source area to the surface, hazards, and maybe some on planetary volcanism as well. And I'll try to mix all these up as we go through the semester. And hopefully if you've had other courses, upper division geology courses, you'll start to see some overlap. Anybody had petrology? couple of you will see overlap with petrology, maybe mineralogy, um, perhaps structural geology. Volcanology is, it's really just all these other areas of geology applied to volcanoes. So there are volcanologists who specialize in the structural geology of volcanoes. Others look at the geomorphology. I'm kind of a volcanic geomorphologist. I look at the landforms that volcanoes produce and try to get some idea of what the volcano was doing when it produced them. Um, you have volcanic geophysicists, you have volcanic petrologists, all different areas and subdisciplines of geology all kind of play in the volcanic realm here. So I'll try to introduce you to all of those things. All right, you guys ready? We'll just dive right in. So we're gonna to look today at just what the definition of a volcano is, and we'll start to get into some background concepts, some physics and chemistry that you will need to know to understand things that we will talk about the rest of the semester. All right, so what I'd like you to do first is think about why are you here? Why did you take this course? What is it that you wanna learn? A lot of times, you just choose a course because the title sounds interesting or you heard something about the way it's run or a professor, but think of it in terms of content. What is it that you wanna know about volcanoes, okay? Every one of you probably is in here for a slightly different reason. And as a professor, I wanna make sure that each of you takes away the things that you came to this course to learn as well as some other things as well. So use that as kind of a way to think about questions you can ask me to guide me towards those areas that you want to learn more about. So not just tonight, but as the course goes on, always give thought to why you're in here and what you want to learn. I think you guys are always used to having the professor decide, this is what you're going to learn in this class. You'll get some of that obviously, but think about what you might want to learn while you're in here as well. All right. Go all grade school on you. In your notes, I want you to draw a volcano. Your conception of a volcano. It might be advanced, it might be really simple. You can just draw the surface of the volcano. If you know something about where the magma comes from, you can draw the subsurface, you can label things. So basically, take five minutes or so, draw out everything that you know about volcanoes. and kind of see what you know and what you don't know at this point. Try to do a good job with this.
Okay, so normally I just sort of walk around the room and take a peek at what you're drawing to see the variations and the diagrams that you come up with, but I'm not going to swap germs with you guys and you're not going to swap them with me. So, let's just talk about your drawings from a distance here. What's, what kind of shape does your volcano have? Who can tell me about the shape? How many of you drew something sort of steep-sided and symmetrical? Okay, anybody draw something different? What'd you draw? It's kind of like shorter, but more wide. Shorter, more wide. Okay, for a lot of you, I mean, kind of the, if you ask pretty much anybody to draw a volcano, they're going to draw something steep-sided, symmetrical, with some stuff coming out of the top. That's usually the basic volcano that, even if you went to, like, grade school kid, they would tr probably draw. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's one type of volcano, but if you think of it in a much broader sense, kind of from a planetary perspective, those kind of volcanoes are pretty rare. And in fact, Earth is really the only place where we see those tall symmetrical volcanoes. Most volcanoes are shaped like this upside down paper plate over here, and that might be sort of what you're talking about. Uh, if you go back to your physical geology class, you remember shield volcanoes, right? They're very broad, sloping, slopes of one to three degrees, um, but very broad and extensive basically because they're made up of a different magma than the tall, steep ones that you see. The reason most people draw the tall, steep ones is because that's what we find on continents, composite volcanoes. Those are the kind of volcanoes that exist where people live. We don't have a whole lot of these kind where people live, but we have lots of, all, of composite volcanoes. If you guys have stuff coming out of your volcano, what's coming out of it? What well, volcano stuff? What sort of volcano stuff? Ash, gas. Ash, gas. What else? Lava. Anything else? Some large pieces of rock. Okay, stuff bigger than ash, right? Yeah, you can find volcanoes that'll toss rocks much bigger than this room and quite far. Mount St. Helens would have erupted in 1980 through rocks the size of houses, 18 miles. That's almost from here to the interstate. That's pretty explosive. So, yeah, they can be pretty, pretty impressive things. So we have a shape that can vary. We have stuff that comes out of volcanoes. How many of you um, had mud coming out of your volcanoes? Anybody have mud? That's the one most people miss, and that's actually probably the volcanic product that kills the most people here on Earth, our mud flows, simply because they travel so far compared to the other types of volcanic products. Do you guys have anything going on beneath the surface? What's going on down beneath your volcano? You have a magma chamber, okay? How many of you drew magma chambers? Probably most of you. What shape did your magma chamber take? The traditional. The traditional, like a big <laughs> filled in <laughs> cave, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And for a composite volcano, it's actually not a bad drawing. For composite volcanoes, magma tends to be stored in rather large underground cavernous areas. The magma chamber beneath Yellowstone is three to five miles beneath the surface, which isn't down very far. And it's about 60 miles wide. So basically here to the airport, Denver airport. So extensive. But if you go to places that have shield volcanoes, a lot of times those magma chambers don't look like what you guys drew at all. And in fact, it's not really even a cavern if you go to places like Hawaii, it's just a series of cracks, hundreds of cracks, some very narrow, some as wide as this room, thousands of interlocking, interlacing cracks, and that's where magma is being stored, just in a crack system beneath the volcano. So a little different than kind of the traditional drawings that you might have. Where is your magma chamber relative to your volcano? Do you have a depth in mind? They aren't very deep. In fact, where does magma originate? This is one of the biggest misconceptions we get in geology. Where does magma actually come from? 
usually it's at the base of the crust upper mantle okay that's where a lot of it starts so it's really right at the top of the mantle and upward depends on your environment if you're in an ocean environment that may only be three four kilometers beneath the surface if you're here on the continents it could be much deeper 30 40 miles so we'll kind of get into all of that but keep a sense of scale how big is your volcano I'm guessing you guys probably didn't put a uh, scale bar there, right? How big are volcanoes? Mountain size, for the most part. You look at the volcanoes in the Pacific Northwest, go up and look at Mount Rainier, over 14,000 feet, and the surrounding area is about 1,000 feet. So you've got 13,000 feet of relief there. Mauna Loa in Hawaii is 13,000 feet above sea level, but that volcano extends to the base of the ocean floor, another 17,000 feet beneath the surface of the ocean. So the entire volcano is 30,000 feet high. It's technically the tallest mountain on Earth. Everybody thinks Everett's the highest elevation-wise, but Mount Everest is 29,000, 28 feet. It's surrounded by an area that's 17 to 19,000, so it's only about 12,000 feet of relief. Much more impressive to go to Mauna Loa. And yet Mauna Loa is kind of a baby too, because if you go to Mars, we have Olympus Mons, which is 90,000 feet. Which is rather, on a planet that's a third the size of the Earth. So we'll talk about why you get some of these variations in scale on volcanoes a little bit later. So what I'd like you to do now, you drew a volcano, okay, and you drew various aspects of it, I want you to give me a definition. Come up with a working definition for a volcano. Something that you could tell another college educated person. If they ask you, what is a volcano? What would you say? Use your drawing as a basis. See what you come up with. This is not easy. I'll give you a couple minutes to think of something. All right, what'd you come up with? Anybody want to offer up a definition? Be brave, be bold, go ahead. All right. Um, so I just a, a physical mountain geography which stores magma and releases it as lava during eruptions. Okay, so it's a mountain. 
some sort of feature, right? Some sort of geomorphic feature, we can call it what it is, a mountain in your case, that stores magma. We're gonna have to define magma here in a minute too, but we'll get to that. Stores magma and erupts it, did you say as lava? Okay, anybody wanna modify that or go with something different? It's not a bad definition. There's no perfect definition. I've never found a definition that I'm like, that's it. That's it, man, that's the perfect one. I don't even like my definition. I can poke holes in my definition too. What else do you got? Anybody have something a little different? You didn't all have exactly the same thing. I know that. Come on, offer one up here. Or is there something from his definition that you'd like to modify? Okay. It's the physical representation of a location in which magma makes its way to the surface of the planet. Okay, so a physical representation. Okay, so maybe a mountain. It doesn't have to be a mountain, right? Or Volcanoes can yeah. be small, right? Okay, they might not be mountain size. Some can be rather tiny. There's a volcano in Kamchatka, Russia, Tolbachek. It's a crack. About every 10 or 15 years, just this big crack opens up and really fluid magma comes up to the surface and flows out as really runny lava flows, just sort of spreads all over the whole area. From a distance, you don't even know it's there. It barely gets above the trees in the area. It's just a series of lava flows. So it doesn't even really form a mountain. It is a construct. I mean, it's obviously added material to the Earth's surface, but it's not mounded up in really any way at all. So it doesn't always have to be mountain size. Okay, any other modifications that you wanna throw out there? I just like how she described it as the way magma comes to the surface. An opening from which An opening in the Earth's crust that mag magma comes through, right? All right, hold that thought, because we're gonna talk about magma in a minute. Magma is not as simple as you might think. And, well, let's get to that. All right, we're not gonna compare drawings. This is another definition. It's really similar to what you guys came up with. It's more from a geomorphology standpoint, a geomorphic fig feature. In other words, it's a modification of the Earth's surface. That's the way to think of a geomorphic feature. It could be a mountain could be a lava flow, could be a mound of something, could be funny shape, through which eruptive products, so it's not just lava, it could be gas, it could be ash. There was a really deadly volcanic eruption at a place called Lake Nyos, Nigeria, back in the 80s. It's a volcano that had a lake inside and CO2 gas was coming up and that's all that came up and it accumulated at the bottom of this lake. And then in the middle of the night, nobody knows quite why, all that gas bubbled up to the surface, moved out and down the volcano because the CO2 gas was denser than the surrounding atmosphere. It hugged the ground, it got funneled in the valleys, it went into a village and everybody suffocated. Everybody died. And people showed up the next day, everybody in town was dead. You know, burns, it was cold gas that had been sitting at the bottom of this lake. There was no, it took scientists months to figure out what had happened because there was no product left behind. Mm. And that's kind of scary when you think about <laughs> that volcanoes can kill people and leave no evidence at all that they actually erupted. And again, that's one of many potential definitions. You get 10 PhD volcanologists up here, you'll probably get 12 different definitions. <laughs> so we'll just, stuff comes out of the ground and accumulates most of the time. All right, 
here's the next stage. Most people talk about magma or lava. All right, let's start with this. What is magma? What did you learn about magma back in your physical geology class or your petrology class? What's magma? Simplest definition possible. Melted rock. What's a rock? Simplest definition possible. Give me a Dr. Baird definition. A solid cohesive <laughs> aggregate <laughs> of one or more minerals. One or more minerals. All right, here's where I'm going to mess you up. Is ice a mineral? It is. So is ice a rock? Yes. Is liquid water magma? Yes. Is liquid water magma? Can I go turn on that faucet over there and have magma come out? Yes. Why isn't water magma? Is it a melted I, mineral? I think that's a rock. An aggregate of one or more minerals. Ice is one mineral, right? Melted ice is water, so it's melted ice magma. Depends who you ask. I consider ice and water to be rock and magma. I do. I see water, liquid water, as magma. And in fact, if you go to some of our outer satellites, satellites of Neptune, satellites of Jupiter, satellites of Saturn, there are volcanoes that erupt mostly ice. Icy, it's kind of an icy slurry of H2O ice, along with nitrogen nit nitrogen compounds and maybe some organic compounds. And it's called cryovolcanism. Cryo meaning cold, volcanism but it erupts on the surface. It's mostly water. And then it freezes on the surface and forms volcanoes. So magma, melted rock. In order to melt something, what do you need to do? Heating up is only one of several me mechanisms for melting things. Can you think of anything else that would induce melting besides heating? Increase the pressure or decrease the pressure? Both. Depends on your mineral. Yeah. If, you, if you decrease the pressure, it'll lower the melting point. And you can change the melting point. So one, one of the things that we have on Earth that causes a lot of melting is we have rocks that are down in the mantle that are really hot, right? If they were that temperature at the surface, these rocks would melt. But because they're under more pressure, it takes a little more heat to force them to break their bonds. What can change all that though, let's say you have a mineral that's down several miles, it has a melting point of 1,000 degrees C, and the surrounding temperature is 950. Is it gonna melt? Melting points, 1,000, surrounding temperature is 950, it's not gonna melt, right? What you can do though, if you add water, it might lower the melting point of that mineral down to say maybe 930. And you get instant melting without adding any more heat at all. So you can change the melting point, you can change the pressure, or you can change the heat. And those are all things that we'll talk about that can induce melting here on Earth. Do we have volcanoes everywhere on Earth? Any volcanoes in Iowa? No, here on Earth, volcanoes tend to be restricted to certain bands or areas. Where do you find volcanoes on Earth? Give me some environments where volcanoes are common. If you wanted to go to a volcano, where are you going to go? Okay, so you have subduction zones, right? That's where a lot of our continental volcanoes are found. You go up to the Pacific Northwest, we have the Juan de Fuca plate slipping beneath North America plate, and it's creating the Cascade chain. Mount Lassen, Shasta, Sisters, Mount Hood, Rainier, Baker, so on. 
Mount St. Helens, dozens of volcanoes up there. Where else would you go besides subduction zones? There are hot spots in the ocean mm -hmm. crust. Give me a volcano that forms an oceanic hotspot. Hawaii. Hawaii. We have continental hotspot volcanoes such as the place we didn't go, Yellowstone. Where are most of the Earth's volcanoes formed? Not in the places you've mentioned so far. Mid-ocean ridges, where we have plates that are being pulled apart. Dropping the pressure in that area, mantles really close to the surface. That's where most of the world's volcanoes are located. But because they're beneath the ocean, they're the least studied. So here on Earth, we have volcanoes that are located in bands, along mid-ocean ridges, some continental margins, and occasionally we get a few oddballs that are sitting out in the middle of continents or ocean plates. Now, if you go to Mars or Venus, the volcanoes there are not in bands. Venus, they've done statistical models of Venus to see if there's any alignment of the volcanoes there at all. There's somewhere between four and 600 large volcanoes on Venus. Statistically, it's a random orientation. There's no alignment at all. And yet here we have Venus. It's about the same size as the Earth. In many ways, it's similar to the Earth, but the volcanoes are not aligned in bands. What does that tell you about Venus? It's different. What doesn't it probably have that the Earth does have? Tectonics. Plate tectonics. So probably no plate tectonics on Earth. And if you look at Mars, there's no alignment of the volcanoes there either. There's three of them kind of in a line and then all the rest of them are all over the place. So just by looking at the spacings of volcanoes on different planets, you start to realize that the Earth is really different than some of the neighbors. We're the only planet that we know of that's developed plate tectonics. So then you start asking the why. And that is a great question. And it's something that not a lot of agreement with in the scientific literature. The main idea is that Earth formed at a distance from the sun where we got most of the water. And if you look at our surface, we have lots of liquid water. But we also have lots of water in our rocks. We have lots of hydrous phases. And if you've taken mineralogy with Dr. Baird or petrology with Dr. Baird, you probably mentioned some of these hydrous minerals. Hydrous minerals may be what allows Earth to have plate tectonics. But it's not so simple. Okay. Is water magma? Discuss that. Depends who you ask. I think it's magma. You don't have to think it's magma. Okay, we're going to take a little break. I do not want to talk for an hour and a half straight, so we'll be back in about five minutes and we will do this again. Okay, I guess we can get started. Um, this is volcanic geology. Um, Dr. Anderson, you can call me Dr. Anderson. I'd prefer you call me Steve. We're all adults here, so we can probably act like it. I'm not going to hand out a syllabus. Uh, there'll be a syllabus on the um, Canvas site. If there isn't already, I'll put it up tomorrow. But I will go through the major parts of the syllabus here at the beginning of class. So this is an advanced geology class on volcanoes. Volcanoes are my specialty. I've been studying them a long time. I'll try to pass some of the things that I've learned through the years on to you in this class. And you can kind of take a look at the major course goals here. Um, I think one thing that I probably do a little different than most other folks that teach this course is I tend to look at volcanoes from a really big picture, kind of a planetary picture. We're not just going to look at volcanoes on Earth. We're going to look at volcanoes on Earth and some of the other planets as well to get kind of a full range and understanding of how volcanism works everywhere. And I think that helps us actually understand what's going on here on Earth. Uh, might as well get the COVID thing out of the way right away. Obviously, it's going to be interesting, maybe weird, odd semester. We 
we're starting off that way. I don't know how long this is going to last. It might last the whole semester. We might all be home in two weeks. Um, I'll do my best to give a good face-to-face -face learning experience for you, but if at any time I don't think it's safe to be here, we're not going to be here. If at any time you guys don't think it's safe to be here, please tell me and then go ahead and do the 